ask you all, first of all, is from your own perspective, imagine you're in the command and control room. How would you make the transition to net zero possible? What roadmap would you want to draw? And is there any additional science that we need to facilitate this transition? Mary, so, I'm giving you the magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to start off by congratulating Frontiers. Thank you for inviting me to the panel and for the wonderful way that you have pulled off the jury and the awarding of the prizes and these activities this week. They've been fantastic. So you may have heard that my name is Mary, and if I was in the control room, which I would prefer not to be, people would continue to call me Scary Mary, which is what my students call me. So I don't want to be any more scary than I already am. So what I would like to do, though, is I think we've heard a lot about very good science, very good technologies over this last week, but I don't think we've heard enough about human behavior and well-being and the psychological impacts we heard some this morning. But I think it's time we raise the emphasis on how are people going to behave into the future and what kind of transformation pathways should we put in place to make people feel that they belong in this planet that we are changing. So I look forward to trying to spend a number of years interacting with young minds, because I think they are very important in terms of influencing people, as well as faith communities, because they have access to such large groups of people. So I would like to work with those people into the future. And I personally, it may seem very naive, would like to work in a world where people are more reflective, humble, and are going to institute technologies, especially into the developing world, where they can do it in a just way and equitable. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Well, I think that we have the science, we have the technology, um, we have the economic resources necessary. What we don't have is the political motivation. I think that in the end, it's a political problem, that we have too many politicians making bad decisions and too many citizens supporting bad politicians. And to give just one glaring example, you think about Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Besides the terrible tragedy for the millions of Ukrainians, uh, it also derailed the efforts to deal with the existential crisis that humanity is facing. If all the money, resources, energy that have been wasted for more than a year on bombing people, if this was invested in dealing with climate change, we would already be on the road to solving the problem. And if politicians continue to make these kinds of decisions, then um, the science and technology by itself won't be able to, uh, uh, to prevent a catastrophe. Um, so basically, you know, we need to work together as a species, which sounds very, very elementary, but we are just not doing it. Johan, politicians are a bit of a problem. <laughs> a bit of a headache, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, to, just to follow up on, on Yuval first, I mean, we know from the work of I mean, many, many scholars have done it, but Nick Stern and Vera Song were recently re released a report showing that between two and three trillion US dollars per year would solve the climate crisis. That's something like 3% of global GDP. We know how to do it, and it's a very doable percentage of global GDP. But the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute released this report just two, three days ago, showing that last year, 2022, we put 2.2 trillion US dollars in weapons. So we're actually investing in just one year the amount of money that would solve the entire climate crisis in one go. So I mean, I, I think Yuval's point here is absolutely fundamental. But back to your question, you know, the problem is we don't have a control room. There is no cockpit for the planet. 
And I know that is very provocative to say that I think the science now tells us that we need a control room for the planet, but we don't have it. And I would argue, you know, with, with you know, adamantly that you can actually have power at the global level in a democratic way because we do it otherwise. And I think it's a proof during the pandemic that we handed over quite a lot of our power to the World Health Organization. They set the rules. They could even, you know, the World Trade Organization also has very strong powers. Uh, we had a volcanic eruption stranding all aviation during a period based on rules that we've agreed to hand over. Why don't we do that when it comes to managing the stability of the planet? So let's assume we have a control room then. So what would I do when I sat there? Well, I think that we should, very much inspired by you actually, Yuval, because you've been pointing out that what we're lacking is, is the narrative. We don't have the story of the future. And I think we're sitting here with the best untold story in town. You know, it's like, it's like the Lords of the Rings. You know, we're heading towards Mordor. We all want to Rivendell and we know the pathway to get there. Let's get that story out and put that into the cockpit and make everyone enthusiastic over this transition. I mean, that I think is what is to a large extent lacking. But Yuval, we're not getting across our message to politicians. Is that simply because of their short termism? No, because politicians are good at also building long-term stories which inspire people to take a um, somewhat controversial, counterintuitive example. If you think about anti-immigration parties, which have been doing quite well in different parts of the world lately, and they are scaring people about things that will happen in decades. Mm -hmm. Like when they talk about, I don't know, like, I don't know the, the UK becoming dominated by immigrants, they are talking like in 30 years or 40 years, they are not talking about tomorrow. And this is very effective. In gaining, uh, in gaining votes, in mobilizing people. So it's not the time horizon. Uh, it is possible to ter tell very compelling stories about things that will happen in decades. And, and Johan, I mean, you've made this uh, Netflix documentary and you've had more impact with that single Netflix documentary than with hundreds of science publications. I'm sorry, that's probably quite galling for a scientist. Your publications mean nothing. It's just <laughs> Netflix. <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell that to my, my board or my... <laughs> <laughs> but so what are the most impactful communication strategies and science policies that mm. you've come across that effectively mobilize the stakeholders that we really need to catalyze the transition to net zero? Mm. Well, let, let me just make one thing straight before coming to, to your question. I mean, if it hadn't been for the science, there would be no documentary. So it's as simple as that. It's a production chain. And, and we would have never come to a planetary boundary documentary if it hadn't been for the tremendous work from the scientific community across so many disciplines that kind of synthesizes all the way to the point where it's mature enough to be plugged into a documentary. Then, of course, I think it's, it's clear why, why are scientists like myself stepping out of our comfort zone, doing crazy things like a documentary for Netflix. Well, it's because we are getting so nervous about the evidence that we're sitting in front of our computers, in our labs, out in the field. And, and I think we have a responsibility to do it, but I, I would like to say that it's in, in, I have many, many colleagues that are not so comfortable in stepping out and communicating and being active in new ways of, of bridging science to society. But we do it increasingly also because it's not that we think it's great fun and we certainly don't get rewarded for it in the academic system. Welcome to our world. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, it's, but it's something that we simply need to do. And, um, and, and I think that is, uh, is, is I think, the, the most correct answer to this. Then, then, of course, I should say personally that, you know, I feel a special responsibility because I've been privileged to be able to work with so many fantastic people outside of science and opening up this opportunity to translate science in, in narratives that can reach out beyond academia. And, and once that door is open, I think given the urgency, we simply have to, it's a bit like the discussion, Henry, on open access. I mean, it's to accelerate science. Well, if, if science has an opportunity to reach out to, to the hearts and minds of citizens, well, damn it, we better do it. I mean, we simply must do it. It's not easy because, um, as you know, you, it's not easy to read a scientific paper and, and, and we have to survive reviews to get it published and have any chance in the competition academic system. 
But then we need help in translating it. And I think we've become better at, at working together, holding hands, to actually reach out. I mean, we would never have done the Netflix Breaking Boundaries if it hadn't been for um, you know, the, the, uh, all the teams that, that worked with that translation. And the Silverback team is actually here in the, at this meeting. And, and you know, without them, it would never have happened. But also, you, I guess you have to cede the space to somebody who is a good communicator within the community. It, because not all scientists are great communicators. And you need you know, to enable the person that is the really great community to let them get on and, and, and do it. Mary, what about in, um, throughout Africa? How would you enable this better story to be told? Well, I think we have lots of excellent stories but we don't tell them. We tend to be much more negative about the way we're moving forward, mostly driven by politics. And I work in a field of research called systems analysis. And systems analysis is about the components of the system and how they all fit together, much of what we've heard the last few days. But I think what's very important is that it's not the individual components that matter, but it's the way they connected to each other. And that's what we need to emphasize, is can we explain the connectedness between parts of the system? So if we damage a particular part, could we have this cascading negative effect, or would we get some things that completely run out of control? And one of the areas we're trying to apply systems analysis in Southern Africa and in most of Africa is in the field of sustainable agriculture. Because if you look at the comparisons between what we heard earlier today of agriculture in many parts of the world, especially the Northern Hemisphere, having a major impact on greenhouse gas emissions, the average use of nitrogen fertilizer in Africa is eight kilograms of nitrogen per year. In Europe, it's 400 kilograms of nitrogen per year. So it's completely inequitable. And, and yes, I mean, it, it underlines this <laughs> central point, doesn't it? Is yeah. that it, it's the global south is not doing the damage, other people are, and yet they're the ones taking the damage, as it were. But I think. We can't say, well, too bad, we're just not going to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge it, but we have to move forward. And we can't continue to blame each other. We all just have to work together into the future. So the one example I'd like to give that is happening very positively in Africa is with uh, certain producers of fruits, like mangoes and avocado pears, where we have nearly 40 million smallholder farmers in Africa, about 80% of those are women. And we've got some medium scale farmers and then some very big large scale commercial farmers. And because of politics and rules and regulations and land tenure, many of those people have not worked together in the past. But I think this climate crisis has pushed these communities together. And we are really trying to further that intervention. So, for example, many of the large-scale farmers can create the export markets for good quality fruit to the northern hemisphere. They can put in the capital, they can take the best quality fruit and export it to other parts of the world. But then what happens to the poorer quality fruit? So we looked at that as a system. And in many places now, what we've done is we've built factories, small-scale factories, to produce products from mangoes. And I'm sure many of you have drunk mango juice, have eaten mango acha, which is a chili-based relish. And so what we're doing is taking what would have been food waste, which is a horrible story all around the planet, and actually turning it into a product, and that is very valuable. And so I think these are these good luck stories which show people that we can work together, not the big rich farmers only and the small poor farmers, but let's bring those communities together. And that's what 
systems analysis allows us to do is to try and identify where unintended consequences can be. Because that's the big risk, especially around policy. Mm. And unfortunately in Africa, many of the food policies that were supposed to enhance food security have had exactly the opposite effect. And we, how do you then tell a community who had trust in you, oh no, the policy was wrong. Let's, uh, let's revise that. That takes a lot of courage to go in and revise policies and to make sure that they're implemented. So that's our trying a positive attitude to communication. So Yuval, you are the master communicator. And one of the things that most struck me about Sapiens was how the thing that distinguishes Sapiens is our facility for storytelling mm -hmm. and the creating um, the, the stories that make sense to most and how those shape behavior and thus society. So how can we make a healthy planet such a story? I mean, after all, it was storytelling that created the United Nations, which doesn't exist. You know, there's not a tangible thing you can touch. Yeah. It's a, it's a, system, and a system of values that we've created through storytelling. How do we do the same for the planet? So if I may quote another great storyteller and singer and thinker, uh, Sting, uh, he's saying in Russians, um, we share the same biology regardless of ideology. And he's saying this in the context of the Cold War and the threat of nuclear annihilation. And I think it's, it's, it's even doubly true with the uh, challenges we now face, that the basic story that we all need to tell and retell is the, that the biological story of Homo sapiens which unfortunately is get uh, a lot of politicians for ideological reasons keep rejecting it. Uh, you know, just last month, the Ugandan parliament has passed a bill that uh, decreased the death penalty for homosexuality. When asked to explain this horrible bill, the Uga Ugandan government said that uh, homosexuality is a Western invention which is alien, foreign, to Ugandan cultural and traditions. And this, of course, stands in complete disregard of the consensus in science that homosexuality is not a unique cultural feature of this or that culture. It's part of the normal spectrum of human sexuality. It's common in all homo sapiens groups and even in other mammals and, and birds. And, of course, you see this kind of ideological denial of, of science in, in Europe, in, in the United States. Hungary has banned, has closed down all departments in Hungarian universities of gender studies and uh, effectively bans scientists in Hungary from researching or teaching gender uh, for the same similar ideological reasons. The governor of Florida, who may be the Republican candidate for US president in 2024, has banned schools in Florida from teaching kids about sex and gender. And of course, politicians are in charge of policies. This is not the job of scientists. But the poli policies politicians uh, in, in, in implement must be based on scientific facts. And again, um, I understand why the uh, scientific facts about sex and gender are uh, undermined certain ideologies around the world. But it should be clear that we as scientists, that when politicians feel they can deny the science, for instance, about human sexuality, there is a very short road from there to denying the science about vaccines, about epidemics, about climate change. If it's uncomfortable for me politically, then I'll just deny the facts, deny the science. And uh, we should stand united against this trend and insist again and again, especially when it comes to human beings, to stand on the fair ground of the facts of human biology. And another key ingredient in this story of Homo sapiens, the biological story of Homo sapiens, is a lot of politicians, also voters, they wrongly think that if they acknowledge the uh, common biolo biology 
of humans, this will somehow undermine uh, uh, national loyalties or national traditions. And this is based on a wrong understanding of what nationalism and patriotism mean. Nationalism doesn't mean hatred of foreigners or strangers or minorities. Nationalism means love for your compatriots. Like you pay your taxes honestly so that other people in your country will get good health care. This is nationalism. It's not about hating anybody. And there are many situations when in order to take good care of our compatriots, we must cooperate with foreigners. And dealing with a pandemic is one example. Dealing with climate change is another example. So I think this should be the common basis for our story for the 21st century. That we all share the same biology, regardless of ideology, and that cooperating with foreigners is done in order to help our compatriots. It's in no way being disloyal to our nation or to our traditions. Johan. Your reflections on that, how would you take that on? No, I, I'm so much in agreement with you, Yuval, and I would actually love to take it to the next level. I, I think we should bring biology all the way to the planetary scale. We know that the prime reason why we, over the last 150 years, have allowed ourselves to just transgress outside of planetary boundaries is that we've completely disconnected our world from planet Earth. And we have, you know, living un under this completely unscientific and naive belief that we can have infinite growth on a finite planet as if there are no boundaries or budgets to be respected. And this is a very dramatic development also in terms of the urbanization we see in the world. We're soon 70% of the world population living in cities with young generations basically never seeing the dependence of functioning ecosystems providing food and biomass and energy and stability of everything that, that we love and that we depend on for not only what, what gives us quality of life, but also what matters for the economy. And, and somehow we have to reconnect. And I think it's, it, it's very much about universal principles on reconnecting people to planet means biology. I would add biology and physics. Because much of what we are causing in terms of unstoppable or potentially catastrophic risks is changing thermodynamic functions in the Earth system. I mean, it is what I talked about earlier, about the whole overturning of heat in the ocean, about the carbon cycle. You should know that every one degree Celsius of, of mean temperature rise, which actually is an energy imbalance, it's physics, leads to 7% more moisture in the atmosphere which causes even more destructive floods and even more extreme precipitation events. So you get more droughts and floods, you power the whole system. And that requires us to, to be more, I would argue, more deterministic and much more aligned with biology and physics and recognize that we have to play by the book spelled out by planet Earth itself. I tell my students sometimes that the only reason why there's an uncertainty range when we set the safe boundaries is that we as scientists have not gotten the answer yet. But if, if Mother Earth would have been with us here on stage and we could interview her, she would tell us immediately what the numbers are. She would give us the nine boundaries and the nine numbers like this, because they're there and they're excite, exact, they're very precise, and we're searching for them. So, you know, we should not cheat ourselves. I think it's, it really is fundamentally about biology. But I have one hypothesis, and perhaps a question <laughs> to you, Val, which is, I've not seen any science on this yet, but there must be people studying it. I'm absolutely convinced that the people that are you know, fundamentally questioning the rights of, of uh, homosexuals, uh, questioning um, you know, hatred against uh, immigrants and foreign people, questioning science, questioning vaccine, uh, the kind of the, the ultimate nationalist, I think these are the same people. They're actually, if it hadn't been the same people, the percentages would actually mean that we're all culprits. But, but it would make it much easier if we got a better, a better mapping of these uh, unscientific, uh, unconstructive positions, because I think that they are concentrated among the same percentage in the population. And it comes back to discussions we've had throughout the day here, that if you look at a normal distribution of population, we don't have to convince the whole majority 
to tip things in a positive direction. We need small enough minorities to tip the logic in the whole society. And this number is somewhere between 15 and 20 percent, pointed out not least by Vice President Al Gore. Empirics show this is correct. And if the, the, the dark forces in society also just add up to 10, 20 percent, which I think is roughly the number, it's a big number, but, but there's certainly not a majority, then I think we're in a much better position. Because then it's a question of moving the alliances of the willing across positive tipping points. Because I know I shouldn't say this in a forum like this, but there are quite a lot of people out there who don't care about science. And if you say science to them, they go over all funny and th their eyes glaze over and they don't want to be involved in it. Well, let me just say one thing there, but that's a misunderstanding. If you have a, and that's well established, if you have a population like this with a normal distribution, you have the denialists over here, sure. two, three percent often, up to 20% if you look at the IFD and the kind of more, more extreme parties on the far right. Up to 20% are really, really engaged in environmental issues. The biggest one in Germany, the Green Party, has 20%. Here, in between, you have 80%. This is the, the silent majority. Many of them don't care about science, but they don't question science. And they're, they're not super engaged in environment, but they're not questioning environment. If you give them a smarter solution, they will take it. If electric cars are cheaper and smarter, they will, they will take it. They don't care about the planet, but they'll take it. If the tomato is cheaper when it comes from an ecological, you know, sustainably produced farm, they will buy it simply because it's smarter and tastes better. So, you know, the vast majority is a silent majority. I think your category is, is in the majority part, not, not those that we have to be so worried about. Do you agree, Mary? I agree, but what worries me is even though our knowledge of the science has got better and better over the last few decades, we've also seen extreme nationalism, which has been very, very negative. Mm. And so where and how do we recognize where we can manipulate or manage behaviors and attitudes with key countries or key individuals to reach some of these tipping points mm. so that we can bring the community along with us in trying to vote for other parties in seeing the, the well-being of the planet as the most important thing. And perhaps we need to work on methodologies for how we identify where the key tipping communities are. Mm. Yuval, where would you go with this? Well, first, I, I'm, I'm a bit more pessimistic. I think that science denialism is not the preserve of a single mm. uh, uh, political bloc. You see some signs of it also on, on, the, on, the, on the left, especially on, on the far left, so it's, it's not so easy. Um, and also with, with regard to, to, to nationalism and extreme nationalism, I think what we have to do is not allow the extreme nationalists to monopolize the ideals of, of nationalism and patriotism, because then we will lose. Yeah. If we take our stand on science is just about you know, uniting the whole gl globe uh, around some uh, uh, global governments or organizations, we will, we will fail. What science tells us, the biological sciences, certainly the social sciences, is that the group identity is the most powerful uh, uh, motivation for homo sapiens in history we are very far from really being able to have a kind of planetary identity. Mm. So we need to uh, uh, be very, very clear that there is no contradiction between cooperating with other nations on a global level and being still patriotic and still committed to our nation. And it's not some kind of manipulation, it's the truth, because to really take care of uh, our compatriots, no matter which country we live in, to really take care of them in the 21st century, we have to cooperate with other countries. Um, again, climate change is the obvious example. No nation can solve this problem by itself. But we saw the same thing during the pandemic. Like in Israel, we got the va vaccine from Pfizer, which is an international conglomerate based in the United States. They got actually the vaccine from a German company, which was established by Turkish immigrants. And I didn't hear many Israeli far-right uh, 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 patriots saying, no, 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 we don't take this 
<laughs> Turkish, German, American vaccine, we are waiting for an Israeli vaccine. <laughs> so when it comes to these things, we understand very well that you don't need to choose between patriotism and global cooperation. They go together very well. And it's allowing that middle, as it were, to not be silenced by the extremes on either end. Because I think people feel that if they speak up about something, they're going to be shouted down. It's not a comfortable place to be, so they put their heads down. And we need to give them the ability to speak up and know that it's okay to follow the path that we, we would like them and to take. Maybe I'll add to that that I don't think we have much choice. Mm. I mean, even scientists who don't want to be at all involved with any political issues, we just want to fortify ourselves inside our laboratories and not allow any political issues in, it will become more and more difficult in more and more fields. I mean, previously people thought, you know, all these political persecutions of, you know, gender studies or, or history, this is, this is not really science. It's the soft edges of the humanities and the social sciences. We doing really hard science, we are protected from that. And I think that now everybody should realize this is an illusion. The people who thought that epidemiology was a hard science, they realized during COVID that politics come knocking at their laboratories. The people who are working on climate change and environmental studies, they know it for a long time. Certainly the people who are working on computer science, they should be knowing it also. That it's, I mean, we need to be very clear about the difference between science and politics, but the idea that scientists can just completely wash their hands off politics and let other people deal with the messy stuff, I don't think this is realistic in the 21st century. Well, I think we're going to have to end on that. Uh, I suspect we could have gone on for a great deal longer, but uh, unfortunately we have to end. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you.